It was a pleasure uh, to host you in D.C. at our brand new offices. And uh, I just I want to start by picking up on Brian's point. Um, the policy that affects uh, new light duty vehicle manufacturers is to take the automobile and the light truck out of the energy equation, which means higher MPG miles per gallon, which means less gasoline used, which means less money going into the highway trust fund. And it's a real big issue. We're going we're to talk about 54.5 miles per gallon as the future standards for combined cars and trucks for 2025. Um, the way we're going to get there is by alternative energy sources. And our official position is for an increase in the gas tax. And I will tell you, living in Washington and working the Hill, there's not a single person that wants to hear that. And we understand why. So what's the alternative? And we talked, Brian talked a little bit about a VMT, vehicle miles travel tax. But what that does is take away the incentive to buy fuel-efficient vehicles. So it's a real uh, difficult issue that, we, that we're going to deal with, and we have to deal with it as a country because our infrastructure is extremely important, as you all know, to all of us. But I put together a little bit of a slide presentation for the next 10 or 15 minutes, and you were kind enough to give us the commercial, which I have to do. We have 15 automobile manufacturers. We also have five suppliers that are associate members as well. Um, Public policy is what we do at the federal and the state level. We, we work with, with uh, members of Congress. We work with all the states. And we also work with all the regulators as well. And what I want to do is just kind of bring you up to speed on why we're part of the problem and, and what we're doing to address the issues. Um, but clearly, uh, uh, we are, as an automobile industry, we're the bigger, biggest users of uh, gasoline in the country. And we, of course, with the infrastructure as well. Um, but here's, here's, if you look at the numbers and where we're going, and this is why we take it so seriously, and quite honestly, in our trade association, we pride ourselves as trying to work uh, with the legislators and regulators to come up with answers. So we've taken a look at this, and if you just look at what happens with the, uh, the world population, we're at 6 billion, but the projection by 2050 is to go to 9 billion, and you know what's happening in China and India, and the, the, the challenge for supplying all of these uh, fleets is just absolutely incredi incredible. Uh, the economists put it together pretty well with uh, looking at the China and the United States. Um, in 2010, the uh, world consumed almost 87 million barrels of oil a day. And in 2012, the projection is to go to 90 million barrels. And then if you look at U.S. population, um, we're currently at 310 million people, and the projections are go to 350 million by 2030. And that's according to the U.S. Census Bureau. And then what we talked about before with vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, the projection there, and this goes back to the 70s. This last year was a little bit of an anomaly. But basically, we've been averaging 1.7 percent per year, and it's projected to increase 60 percent by 2030. Now, I don't know where we're going to put all these cars and where these people are going to be, but there's, there's going to be an awful lot of gridlock. Um, and then we talked this about the car park, which is the number of automobiles and light trucks that are on the road today. Um, today, and it's been growing marginally, but it's about 250 million units. The projection is, is that we go to 300 million by 2050. And if you look at our oil consumption, car park, VMT, um, the projections for our oil, oil consumption is increasing as well. Um, and this goes back, and this is my time when the 70s were there, when we started with the CAFE standards, which we'll get into in a minute. But we were 30 uh, percent of, uh, of what we used were imported oil. Today it's more than 50 percent. So it's directionally not the way that the, that the policy was supposed to take us. Um, so what I want to do now is very briefly give you a history of the automobile industry in the fuel economy policy. Um, and we'll go back and take a look at it. Back in the, in the 70s, when we had the first oil embargo, uh, gasoline was uh, uh, 36 cents a gallon. And in 1972, it went to 86 cents, and seven, in 79, rather. And people were just outraged at having to pay that kind of money for gasoline. Um, the big oil embargo of 73 led to CAFE standards, which are corporate average fuel economy which the industry has been living with since 1974. They actually kicked in in 1979. Uh, back then, the average mile per gallon for a car was 13 miles per gallon. And from a historical point of view, and I throw this in, is the Detroit automakers, which was Ford, GM, uh, Chrysler, and American Motors back then, was 85% uh, of the market, dramatically different from where we are today. 
so from a historical point, we had the oil embargo in, in 73, 74, and then beginning in late 80s, there was a, a growing concern over greenhouse gases and, um, energy and, and climate change. And the point here is, is that the way that we determine what the fuel economy of a car is, is by capturing the CO2 from the tailpipe. So you actually measure, that's the EPA does the measurement, and then uh, it's translated by formula into a miles per gallon, and that's how compliance is determined. Um, and of course, CO2 is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. It's, it's the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases. Um, so we had been, the industry had been meeting CAFE standards from 79 through 85, 87, 89, 90 and all. And then in, in uh, California, and this gets very confusing, but I'm trying to set up the decision making process here. Under the Clean Air Act, EPA regulates tailpipe emissions. And, and California decided that they wanted to regulate greenhouse gases or CO2 from the tailpipe. And remember, CO2 is the same as CAFE. So California was going through that process. We were litigating it. And then in 2007, the Supreme Court decided that, in fact, EPA, if they chose to, could regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. So we were going into the 2007-2008 time frame with the, with the very realization that we were going to have the Department of Transportation regulate CAFE standards under one statute. The Environmental Protection Agency was going to regulate greenhouse gases or tailpipe standards, CO2, same thing as miles per gallon under the Clean Air Act, a different standard. California was going to regulate greenhouse gases, CO2, miles per gallon under their statutes, under, under a waiver. And then 13 states had also adopted the California program. And compliance with fuel efficiency standards or, or all of these greenhouse gases is based on what we sell into a market. So it's an average of the, of the sales into that market. So we were looking at a standard from the feds, a DOT, standard from EPA, standard from California, and then have to manage our sales into 13 different states to make sure we could be in compliance with the standards. Everybody we talked to said this made no sense. So how did we fix it? That's, that's where we are today. So on May 19th of 2009, after many, many meetings and some, some clandestine meetings out in California, we, we got an agreement with the Obama administration that EPA and DOT would coordinate their standards with California, and we could, we could sell one fleet of cars in all 50 states and be in compliance as long as we hit the numbers that we had to, that we had to meet. And this was, this was not easy. Um, the standard was uh, 30.1 and was going to go to 35.5 in 2016. And then we just had another agreement with the administration, and there was a Rose Garden, well, it wasn't a Rose Garden, it was, a, it was actually at the D.C. Convention Center, but it was proposed standards for 2025 from 47 to 62 miles per gallon. And, and again, we had been at 27.5 miles per gallon for years. Um, we had agreed 2016, 35.5. Uh, 47 to 62 is huge, and the average for that is 54.5 miles per gallon combined car and truck, which is like a 20 mile per gallon increase over the 2016 uh, standards. This is all being proposed. It'll be proposed next month as a, as a notice of proposed rulemaking. It'll go through public comment, but the idea is, is that they'll be finalized um, in September of 2012. So what this means is if you look at where we are today at 31.1 car and truck, 2016, 35.5, and 54.5 is what's on the books for 2025. So then the question is, is how are we going to get there? Um, and the costs are not inconsequential. 50.5 uh, billion for 2016, and the estimates are somewhere around $150 billion for the 2025 time frame. That's a lot of money. Um, our engineers are hard at work. This is just a, a, a sample listing of what we're doing. And some of you might not be familiar with all of these terms, and I'm not familiar with all of them, but something like cylinder deactivation, which if you have a six-cylinder vehicle and you're driving down the highway at 60 miles per hour, two of the cylinders are going to shut off, and you're going to save fuel economy that way. Um, friction reduction, anytime you can make your, your engine more efficient, uh, you're going to increase your fuel efficiency. 
Um, some of the things though, like uh, CVTs, continuous variable transmissions, dual clutch transmissions. One, one of the is, some of the things though is, is, is consumer acceptance as well. I put start stop on there, and I was in New York the other day, and um, the driver was uh, had start stop, which is when you actually come to a stop, your engine uh, stops, and then when you when you put your uh, pedal on, you put your foot on the pedal. Of course, it starts up again. Well, he didn't like that, so he put it into neutral every time um, he came to a stop, which, of course, defeated the whole process. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, that, and that's the thing you don't know what the consumer reaction is going to be on something like that. And, of course, to do that, you have to build your starter. It's got to be about four times as robust as a, as a current starter. If, and think about it. If, you're, if your engine's not working and you're getting ready to make a left-hand turn in front of traffic, are people going to be comfortable with that? Is this going to be a positive or is it going to be a negative? So the consumer reaction to all of this is e extremely important. What you're seeing right now, though, is, is and just announced this week, is that four-cylinder engines now are more than 50 percent of what are in the in the new vehicle fleet. So, and you, you see light weighting, you see downsizing, um, and all of that is going to get us into a higher MPG uh, in the near term and probably up through the 2020s or so. But you're going to see more and more of the alternative fuel vehicles as well. Um, and we have this way of looking at this. You, you start out with the internal combustion engine, then you go to the hybrid vehicles, then you go to your battery electrics, and eventually your, your hydrogen fuel cell, all of which takes consumer acceptance, and, and obviously the technology and pricing has to be there, and the infrastructure has to be there as well. So having said all that, and if we can, can solve all of these technology issues, we still have to make sure that our consumer, the customer, wants the vehicles at the end of the day. Um, and the consumer is king, satisfying consumer needs is, is extremely important. And we have a value proposition which we talk about, which just means that what we sell to the consumer, he, he or she has to, has to value, has to, has to say that I, I like this as well as the, the other mar cars that are in the market, that it provides the reliability, the, the cost, the travel um, expectation so that the consumer is happy at the end of the day. And people talk about hybrids, which have been around for a long time. Um, you can see in this graph that basically we peaked uh, around 2006 with about 350,000 hybrid sales. Um, then you have mild hybrids and full hybrids, but basically the, the bottom line is, is that it was a new technology. Everybody thinks that after 10 years it's very robust, but the truth of the matter is, is that we're not selling as many hybrids today as we sold in 2006, and that's in spite of the fact that there are more hybrids on the market today, more models on the market today than there were. And this goes to that value proposition, and there's a, a way to look at it um, and this is pretty classic. I think you, you end up with the innovators, and they're the, they're the ones that go out and buy the, they bought the GM EV1. Uh, they'll buy the Leaf now. They'll buy the, the, uh, uh, the, the new GM hybrid. Because um, they want to be out there front. They want to be seen as, as green. It was very interesting to me that, that Toyota's Prius, which is designed differently from every other car, took off when the Honda, not the Insight, but the, the other one, didn't because it looked just like the internal combustion engine vehicle as well. So, so the early adopters, the innovators are trying to make a, a statement with what they purchased, that I am green, I'm, I'm you know, environmentally friendly, look at me. Um, unfortunately, though, it never made it into the early adopters or even the early majority. And today, hybrid sales are still at 2.5% of new vehicle sales, which is not a lot after 10 years. And that takes us into um, where are we going? And, and this is the challenge, because if we're going to hit the, the numbers for 21 through 25, we're going to have to get further and further away from the internal combustion engine. We're going to have to get to fuel cells, natural gas, the hydrogen, all of the alternative uh, uh, fuels that are out there, renewables and EVs as well. And of course, there's been a lot of work that has been done, done on that. Um, but from a manufacturer's point of view, if we can build the vehicle and we can make it competitive, um, and if the consumer values it, they won't value it unless the infrastructure is there as well. And that's where it comes to the partnership, and that's where the message that we talked about um, last week, when we ho two weeks ago, when we hosted our, our luncheon, uh, you guys at, in, in D.C. Um, and the states are stepping up. There's a lot going on. I have a, uh, an analysis of what Washington State has done in building in EV infrastructure, and um, eventually you'll be able to travel from the length of the state and, and charge your vehicle, fast charging stations, 
it'll still take 30 minutes or so to, to recharge, which is a big issue versus a gas station where it takes, what, five or ten minutes at the most. So the, the whole issue of the consumer being there, working with the states to develop the infrastructure is extremely important if we're going to be successful in moving the automobile and our customers away from the, uh, the model of, uh, of burning gasoline and imported oil. So in, in summary and closing, we need to work together. Um, we are committed to being part of the solution, um, and we think this is going to be extremely challenging. We're working with, the, uh, uh, with our regulators at the federal level to make sure that it's done right. We've got a, a midterm review to see if, in fact, the expectations that we all have going forward are actually going to be met. Can we really bring the consumer on board? Will the technology be there? Um, but we, all of our members recognize that we're in this for the long haul. Uh, they're spending millions and millions of dollars to try to do this, um, and we're hopefully that we're going to be very successful.